and Dixon are beautiful. So uh, I'll turn it over to Dale so he can teach us all about more plants. Th thank you, Lindley. I, I just, first I wanna say that, uh, that all my colleagues here at the Dixon have just done an amazing job at adapting to uh, to the new uh, reality we're living in. I mean, it's uh, uh, they've just embraced this technology and are continuing to produce great content. And uh, and Lindley has uh, has kept the Munch and Learn uh, beat going, and that's just pretty amazing. So uh, I just like to uh, say thank you to all my colleagues out there and keeping the Dixon in the forefront and being creative. And uh, it's just a great group of people that I work with. All right, um, so I, I wanted to bring up some plants that some, are, some have been around for a while, some are new, some are lesser, all of them are pretty much lesser known and lesser used uh, in the Mid-South. And um, all of them I do believe are planted here at the Dixon somewhere and I, I can mention to you as we go along uh, where they're located. I've kind of divided it into trees and most of the trees are smaller trees and then shrubs and then some perennials as well. And um, I have the uh, scientific names on the slide and I will refer to those, but I'll try to use common names as well. Uh, but in case anybody wanted to write it down or go back in and, 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 and check it out later uh, to get the names of some of the plants. So um, anyway, let's, uh, so the title of the talk is Plants That Merit Attention in Mid-South Gardens. So I just, there's just a lot of plants that are overlooked and that's what we're gonna talk about. What did I just do? Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to get the, the thing to forward here. Okay. Um, Lindley, why is it not going? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Cause it went just a minute ago when you tested it. it um, you, can, you can try closing out of it and opening it again and seeing if that works. There we go. Okay. The first plant I want to talk about is kind of a slow growing plant. Uh, it's called Acer grissium. It's known as the paper bark maple. And uh, it, it uh, I think nurserymen don't like it because it's really slow growing, but it is a really attractive plant. And, um, here, here it is in Portland, Oregon, used as a street tree. Um, it's not, uh, it's more of a garden tree here. Uh, they can get by with growing a, a, a lot of things uh, uh, in locations that we probably wouldn't, but uh, this is Acer grissium, and uh, they, they grow about three times faster in the Pacific Northwest, but most things do grow faster in the Pacific Northwest. But look at that bark. Isn't that really attractive? Um, Acer grissium. It has sort of a almost like a river birch bark, except for uh, it doesn't grow out of scale and you know out of size, and uh, the and uh, it doesn't have all the the debris problems that you see from the uh, from the uh, overplanted uh, river birch. You know, there was a period in the late '70s and '80s where everybody had a river birch in their front yard, and uh, uh, most of those are no longer around. And if they are, uh, um, they're shedding a lot of debris. This, I was up in Boston at the Arnold Arboretum. This is Galen Gates. He's the curator of plants. At the time, he was the curator of plants for the Chicago Botanic Gardens. And this is the original Acer grissium that was brought back by, I believe it was the plant, uh, the director of the Arnold Arboretum, Sargent. And uh, so this was a huge plant. It's obviously seen some, uh, some tough times at one point, but uh, very, very attractive. Old, old plants, probably 150 years old. Here's our little modest one at the Dixon, and it's growing and getting bigger, but uh, Acer uh, grissium, paper bark maple. Um, having spent a fair amount of time in the Pacific Northwest uh, as an undergraduate and a graduate student, um, I really fell in love with the conifers. And um, before I moved to Oregon, I'd worked for a rare plant nursery here in Memphis that was Four Fives Nursery on Summer Avenue. And um, one of the plants that they had was this, uh, that Mr. Kessel grew, 
at Four Fives Nursery was a Pisces Orientalis. And he always told me, he said, this is the only cone-shaped conifer that looks like this that you can grow in Memphis. And I had remembered that and, uh, and uh, when I moved back here. And uh, so I was down in Atlanta and in the Atlanta area, actually in, uh, in Athens, Georgia. And that's where I first saw this one growing. And I was like, you know, that is a very, very noble plant. I really like it. And here's the foliage on it. It uh, definitely looks like uh, uh, most uh, 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 Picea. Picea orientalis is the uh, oriental spruce. Anytime you see the name Picea, it's a spruce. Picea orientalis. And I've planted several of them here at the Dixon. This is uh, at the Bowling stage. We have two new ones out there now. Um, this is in Ann Blecken's garden. Ann Blecken uh, passed away uh, uh, several years ago, but she used to be the garden writer for the Commercial Appeal. And her husband uh, was, um, was actually one of the founding members of the American Conifer Society. He was from Washington State. But uh, I just found it interesting that we had a conifer, uh, a founding member of the Conifer Society here in Memphis. This one was called Aria Spicata, which basically just means yellow new growth. Aria meaning yellow and Spicata meaning the new growth that's on there. And uh, it's very, very uh, attractive. And uh, this, they had been growing this for a number of years. They bought it as a small little one gallon plant. And it was uh, maybe three or four feet high. This is one called Skylands. And this is named for uh, a, a garden. I think it's up in Maine that uh, Jens Jensen designed. I think Martha Stewart owns that garden now, Skylands Garden. Um, but anyway, it, it has this yellow uh, um, uh, foliage. A lot of people think it looks like it needs fertilization, but uh, that's its claim to fame. So this is called Skylands. This is one called Gouty that's supposed to be the darkest black, and it's more uh, almost black color, real dark green. And it's wider than, wider than the others. This is called Gouty, which is a good one. So... Those of you who know me know that when I do something, I, I, I usually, it's over the top. So I had had success growing these at the Dixon and, uh, and I had I had someone ask me about uh, what would be a good plant to put in for a, uh, for a Christmas tree. They had planted a Deodora cedar and it quickly outgrew the spot by their chimney. But this plant grows really slowly here in the Mid-South. So it's not gonna outgrow the spot and it makes a nice Christmas tree and a focal point uh, at the front door at this at this residence and so here it is we brought it in from Oregon on a truck and uh, so this is to prove to you that it will do really well here that's been in the ground now for about six years and it's doing very very well here it is in the ground planted and uh, here's one at the Dixon by the by the entrance this this is a cultivar called Skagit um, it has nothing to do with me it's a uh, 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 from uh, Washington State, Skagit, but it works well here in Memphis. So another wonderful plant that is just totally overlooked. I think you have to be a little bit fastidious in where you cite it, but uh, I guess my first year here at the Dixon, I had someone call me up and say, you know, I've got a couple of, uh, of these dove trees, Davidia involucrata, and uh, I've got a couple of dove trees, and I wanted to see if you were interested in one. So we brought them into Memphis. The Botanic Gardens got one, and I got one. And we planted it here uh, behind the Hughes Pavilion in, in a place that uh, got protection from the hot afternoon sun, great morning sun. And um, I remember we, uh, the, the, I guess maybe my second year here, um, uh, the director, Kevin Sharp, and I were walking around with a gentleman who was the keeper of image and words for the uh, uh, Victoria and Albert Museum uh, in, in England. And uh, we were walking him around, touring him around. And about the time we rounded the corner, headed to the Hughes Pavilion, Kevin mentioned to him, Kevin said, do y'all have any grounds to speak of, any gardens or anything around your property? And he said, we've got a little courtyard. And in that courtyard, we have a wonderful dove tree. I never forget it. He said, and people are always calling up on the telly, wanting to know when it's going to be uh, when it's going to be in full bloom. And uh, so um, it's almost like it was the perfect timing, you know, because we just rounded the corner. And Kevin looks at me and he says, "I don't think we can grow a dove tree here. Do you know what a dove tree is?" And I said, "Voila, right here, we planted one." So uh, that was uh, kudos to me. Kudos to me, and I pat myself on the back because I had one planted. But anyway, it was, it was kind of a funny story. But it's a magnificent tree. Some people call it a handkerchief tree. 
And uh, I've certainly seen magnificent specimens in England. And uh, the first few years we had it, we'd get a scattered bloom or two. And it was always exciting. You know, we had a bloom. And then after it was in the ground for about three or four years, it started blooming very, very heavily. And uh, now we get consistent blooms every year. Um, it has these wonderful bracts that hang down. You know, these, the bracts are what's showy on like a dogwood tree. But there's only two of them, and one's longer than the other. So it gives the appearance of handkerchiefs or doves hanging in the tree. Really, really attractive. This was brought back from China. Uh, uh, there was um, a plant explorer. Wilson was a plant explorer who went to China. And he brought this back and successfully germinated it uh, 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 around 1900. So uh, been kicking around the trade for a while. Can, Continuing our trees, um, the, the dove tree is probably a, a medium-sized tree, and I would say this is a medium-sized tree, too. I'd say maybe maybe gets 30, 40 feet. Um, and this is uh, Persian ironwood is what this is called. Uh, and it, it is growing in our parking lot island in this image in the hot, hot sun, uh, full sun in the parking lot. Um, and so uh, no, very little supplemental irrigation. This was here whenever I arrived. It's kind of a wide tree, so that kind of makes it somewhat difficult to use sometimes in certain settings. But uh, there's an upright form named Vanessa. This is called Vanessa, and uh, Vanessa is a tighter habit. And uh, I think, you know, this is certainly uh, never going to replace the crepe myrtle, but if people are concerned about having to treat a tree for crepe myrtle scale, this uh, certainly, this upright form uh, has some of the attributes that a crepe myrtle has. Of course, it doesn't have the flowers that last all summer. Here, it's quite happy in sun or shade. This is its morning sun at the Dixon. This is one I actually transplanted uh, um, my first or second year here at the Dixon. The foliage looks like a witch hazel. And as you can see, uh, it, it, uh, it's in the witch hazel family. It's related to witch hazel. It can have variable fall color. We tend to get oranges and yellows, but, uh, and it seems to vary by seed grown plant. Uh, and the uh, weather conditions also play a role in that. But uh, just a great tough plant. I planted one in my parents' yard in Bartlett as a, as a, as a teenager, and uh, it's still thriving and it's big and it's grown well. It is an underutilized plant for the Mid-South. Uh, in fact, I called up a nurseryman here locally that is, uh, has a, 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 pretty, uh, a pretty large uh, nursery, brings in a lot of plants, and he'd never heard of a perillia. Um, I, I, a couple of, most of these pictures are my own. A few of them came off the web. I found this one on the web. I've never seen it this red, but uh, that rivals that of a Japanese maple, that, uh, that fall color. It's, it's pretty incredible. This is Vanessa again. That's tip, more typical of what we get. Here's the flowers on the Persian ironwood. Uh, it's never going to stop traffic with the flowers. It's not as sh that showy, but it has these flowers, and the flowers come out before the leaves uh, uh, in the uh, late winter. But the bark, look at the bark. It's almost like puzzle pieces on there. Really, really attractive bark. So that is the uh, Perugia, the Persian ironwood. Great plant native to Iran. This is a wonderful plant uh, called the Katsura tree, and it is uh, with a, it's uh, uh, spelled with a K, Katsura Japan, uh, Circinophyllum japonicum. And if you look at the Latin name, Circus is red bud, and it has a heart-shaped leaf. So this is a leaf like a red bud, and I'll show you why here in just a minute. But it's a medium stature tree. I planted these as maybe five gallon or eight gallon plants here at the Dixon. And this was taken this morning. So this is how much they've grown. I've been here, what, 13 years now, and this is about how much they've grown. So uh, pretty fast growing, nice plant. These are more examples of the Dixon. I planted a whole bunch of them in what used to be the Venus Alley, at the end of the Venus Alley. great form to that tree, but it has this almost blue-green hue to it. It's very, very attractive. Here's the name, and while the name says leaf like a red bud, if you know a red bud tree, you know that it has a heart-shaped leaf, and this is very similar in appearance. I love the Circidophyllum. Another great fall color example. 
The bark, not as attractive as that of a parodia, but still very, very attractive. A little bit larger tree than the parodia, and I think it's a little faster growing. <clears throat> the leaves, when they uh, start to uh, fade in the fall, uh, before right, right about the time that the leaves begin to drop, uh, people say that uh, they catch the fragrance of brown sugar, and I've heard cotton candy and other things, and uh, as the leaves start to fall from the tree, for some reason it has this real uh, uh, sweet smell that, uh, that you get in the leaf, leaf drop. And at the Dixon, we've planted a weeping form of this Katsura tree. This is a weeping form, which is almost living sculpture. Here's another example of a weeping Katsura. Uh, really, really a, a, a specimen focal point plant that is uh, totally very little known about and underutilized in the Mid-South. The fringe tree, uh, we have an American fringe tree, but this is the Chinese fringe tree. And I think it's the better of the two. Uh, the trees you're looking at on your screen were actually uh, trees that were over along the uh, western edge of our property, uh, crammed together by the maintenance building. They were sort of intertwined. That's what gave them that upright habit. And we had a tree spade come in, a tree truck spade come in and uh, uh, move these trees uh, over to a new location. So there were five, but in order to dig them, we had to sacrifice two of them. And so we moved them over. Right now, they are a key focal point over at the new Farnsworth uh, building. Uh, this is at the J.C. Austin, J.C. Ralston Arboretum in North Carolina and NC State. And uh, I happened to be there on the perfect day to get this picture. But uh, this is the fringe tree. Billowy panicles of white flowers, fragrant, wonderful. Closer shot of that. Here's uh, what the bloom panicles look like. The fringe tree. And it's certainly a tree for all seasons. I think it looks great in the winter with its structure. I think it, uh, it looks good in the fall with the fall color, and then it also has a fruit on it. Here's the fruit. Um, they're small, but uh, really attractive, and I think the uh, wildlife actually likes the fruit, so. So that was the um, Chiononanthus retusus, or the Chinese fringe tree. Another tree that everybody knows that uh, certainly does not merit any more attention. It's, uh, it's a great plant. I have nothing against dogwoods. I love them. Uh, they're, they're, they're wonderful. And uh, Tennessee uh, nurserymen produce more dogwoods than any other uh, place in the world. So uh, they're wonderful trees. But again, the bracts are what's showing. Um, but about 25 years ago, we started to see mildew on the leaves of some of these. And uh, so they've kind of fallen out of favor a little bit. And uh, University of Tennessee has done a great job at breeding mildew resistant plants. So if you're gonna plant those, you need to look for cultivars that are resistant to mildew because we do have some problems with it here in the Mid-South. And it's prompted a lot of people to use the Kusa dogwood, Cornus Kusa. And uh, Kusas, uh, like the fringe tree, they're gaining in popularity. You're seeing them a lot more. Um, and anyway, they have these star-shaped flowers and the flowers are later than the foliage. The flowers come on in uh, the flowers come on in May instead of April. So it's a little bit later flower, which is nice. And this is the cultivar called Milky Way in the Cutting Garden, and it is just the most floriferous uh, uh, stars stacked up on top of stars. It's a great name, Milky Way. Uh, but notice the foliage is already on the tree. Um, you know, does this plant need more attention? Maybe some, but uh, the cultivar is what I'm going to tell you about here in just a second. Look at those flowers. Really nice, clean, white. And it has a fruit on it uh, that is actually edible. Not that tasty kind of mealy, but it is edible. Um, someone, uh, one of my colleagues here at the Dixon that uh, works at admissions was said, should we be concerned? There's this person picking and eating these. And I said, well, it's okay. They're edible. It's fine. This is the one I want to talk about that I think merits more attention. This is a slow growing variegated, and I'm not a huge variegated plant fan. I mean, I, there are some variegated plants that I truly love, but this is Cornus Cusa wolf eyes. And um, so anyway, it's, uh, it's variegated. Who needs blooms when you have this, right? And uh, it needs a little bit more shade than the other Cusas. Uh, 
or, or the leaf edges will scorch. But uh, if you plant this, it's uh, it's going to look good all season and it'll brighten up a shady corner. Um, it's one of those plants that I think should be used here in the Mid-South more. Cornus Cusa Wolf Eyes. There's another variety that's variegated called Samaritan that's equally as well, but uh, this is the picture that I had. We have both planted here at the Dixon. When you go to England, and actually even if you go as far over as Nashville, you start to see them using a lot of taxes used in the landscape. Yews don't work well for us here. Uh, they're fraught with problems. I think that our, we're a little too hot. We're hotter than the rest of the state of Tennessee. Uh, you can get them to live if you don't overwater them, but I think it's our heavy clay soils and our heat. But we've always done really good with the cephalotaxis, uh, which is uh, it's, uh, the plum yew. And uh, uh, the cephalotaxis, this is uh, cephalotaxis herringtonia prostrata at the Memphis Botanic Gardens very uh, low growing uh, form that you see quite a bit. So uh, it's, it's kind of being used quite a bit these days, but there's another form that I'm really fond of. This is a Cephalotaxis Duke Gardens. This is a wider than tall mounding shrub. This is the original Cephalotaxis Duke Garden from the Serape Duke Gardens in North Carolina. And it is a really, really good plant. Anytime you have a plant that's wider than tall, it is very, very useful to, from a design standpoint, and this fits that bill well. And so we might not be able to grow regular taxis used, but we can grow cephalotaxis, and this is a winner. Very nice plant. A plant that we use as a staple here at the Dixon for the flower arrangements, we have to do the big urn in the Catmer foyer. And uh, one of the plants that we use uh, uh, for greenery in that urn are these arching stems of the Florida Lakothoe. This is Agarista poplifolia. And I think I spelled the poplifolia wrong, I apologize. But um, anyway, um, Google would correct that if you, if you Google that. But, uh, Anyway, Agarista poplifolia, it has a hollow stem. It's known as the Florida Lakothoe. It's a different genus than the true Lakothoe. The true Lakothoe does not do well here. Um, and, uh, but this is the Florida Lakothoe. Um, uh, East Tennessee, they do really well with the uh, straight uh, uh, Lakothoe. Um, I think it's called, the common name is dog hobble or something like that, or pipe stem is another name from the hollow stems. But uh, this is out in Arlington growing. Uh, it's an evergreen. Maybe, uh, you know, it could get up to maybe 12 feet tall, 10 to 12 feet tall, evergreen. Very, very useful to go. Uh, I like to mix it with azaleas. And uh, it's been around for a long time. It's just never really been widely planted. The new growth is kind of a, can be a coppery color, which is very, very attractive. And then it has these wonderful little urn shaped flowers that hang from the bottom and uh, they're slightly scented. Here's the ones at the Dixon. They've been chopped on so much for, for greenery uh, that they've been kept trimmed back. But uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, very sculptural and, uh, and, and, and graceful in its habit. Close up of the flowers. One of our uh, collections here at the Dixon is a boxwood. And, you know, a lot of these smaller boxwood people are learning about. And for some reason, this one is one that I think I'm one of the few people who use it here in town for, uh, for gardens. And uh, I almost have to bring it in or, or specially request it. This is boxwood, John Baldwin boxwood, Bucks's John Baldwin. And uh, the, its claim to fame is that it keeps that cone-shaped habit. A lot of people want to grow dwarf Alberta spruces, you know, those little spruces that have that conical habit. And usually they succumb to our heavy clay soils or spider mites in the summer. And, uh, but this John Baldwin is tough as nails. It'll take full sun. It's an easy to grow uh, boxwood. Uh, doesn't have the problems that a lot of the other boxwood grow. John Baldwin, if you want that conical shape, it's the plant to use. Here's one in a pot that I took this morning by the Dixon, a picture of one in a pot. And this is the size of it. You can expect it to be two and a half feet tall and four foot tall in about 10 years. 
So this has grown a lot since I've been here. This picture was taken early on and uh, it's grown significantly. But look, we didn't even have the Coosa dogwoods planted a year at the time. So it's been, uh, it's been in the ground for a while. Very, very nice plant. That's kind of a, the old growth is kind of blue green and the new growth is really bright green. Very nice plant. This is uh, the Daphne, and uh, Daphne is uh, one of those extremely fragrant plants that tempt gardeners from time to time to try to grow it. I've killed it about six times here in the Mid-South. This is uh, it growing happily in Oregon at the porch at Joy Creek Nursery uh, in Scappoose, Oregon. And um, this is Aria marginata, which basically just means yellow margin. And uh, really, really happy and attractive plant that does not like Memphis. Um, I have seen it growing in, uh, this is down in Georgia, where it's happily growing. Pink in bud, it flowers in the winter time, and, and uh, the flowers open, and it's truly, truly one of those extremely fragrant plants. There was a master gardener that uh, uh, brought, uh, brought a little stem to a meeting when I was, uh, with the Master Gardener program, and he was for a little show and smell. And he was so proud that he was growing this Daphne and got it to grow. And I said, how long have you had it? He said, about a year. And so then the next time I saw him a couple of years later, I, I asked him, I said, how's that Daphne doing? He said, oh, it died. So he's had similar experience. This is one that might work here called Carol Mackey. And it's a little lower growing one. I planted this at my house out in Brunswick. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't know if it's still growing there or not, but uh, this one seemed to do a little better, but it was in a situation where it had perfect drainage. There it is, Carol Mackey. Um, excuse me, that's not Carol Mackey, that's Burke Woodyite. Sorry, Burke Woodyite. But the whole reason that I bring up that plant is this is a Daphne relative we can grow, and it has the fragrance of Daphne. It's not evergreen, unfortunately, but it's still a wonderful plant. We sort of introduced this to the, to the Memphis trade here, and uh, it has these wonderful signs that start about the time the leaves shed on the plant, you can see uh, these sort of round flowers, these cymes that swell to about the size of a silver dollar, and then they open radially over about a month's time. And they're very, very fragrant in the winter. And uh, this is Edgeworthia chrysantha, also known as paper bush. And uh, the chrysantha is smaller than the papyrifera, we've learned. Uh, and the nursery trade has them sort of mixed up in, at, at times. But uh, this is Edgeworthia chrysantha. And uh, I know I got a lot of calls about this this year. A lot of them died back pretty hard when we had that cold snap. It got real warm and then it got cold. And I saw a lot of them die back to the ground, but they've rejuvenated, they're coming out and they look great now. So, uh, but anyway, this is a good plant for the Mid-South. If, uh, if you're not growing Edgeworthy, it's uh, definitely one to add to, your, uh, add to your garden for winter interest. Here it is in the summer. It almost has a tropical, you know, and the foliage is almost a blue green. It's really nice. I think this is actually papyrifera. I think the other one was chrysantha. But anyway, the leaves you can see, there's my hand for scale. And uh, so paper bush, that's a great plant. Edgeworthia chrysantha. And there are several cultivars out there. And uh, we have several of them planted around the property. And uh, uh, definitely want to come check those out when they're in bloom over the winter. It's really, really stunning. <clears throat> Hydrangeas have had a really, really recent, uh, people have just gone nuts over hydrangeas in the past maybe 10 years, 10 or 15 years. And this is one of the lesser known hydrangeas. Uh, there are several hydrangeas that have these fuzzy leaves. And, uh, and I've tried to grow several of them that I grew in Oregon here, and I've killed all of them. This is the only one that will grow here. This is Hydrangea involucrata. And it's claimed to fame is that it's the latest blooming of all the hydrangeas. It is in bloom right now, just started blooming. Has these amazing uh, flower buds and uh, they swell up like a peony and they open up and to have these wonderful lace cap flowers with purple with white, uh, white margins. Just a wonderful pinwheel effect that's really, really nice. Um, actually, these were taken this morning. This picture was taken this morning. So very stunning plant. Um, you know, you can sort of, if you time it right, you can have hydrangeas that start to bloom in, you know, late May and go all the way through the summer. And, uh, and this, this would be the, the, the latest one that would be in that collection. 
And the flowers are attractive as they start to fade. They lose a lot of the purple. There's the flower buds. And as you can see, it's sort of this anticipation. And uh, I leave the flowers on. Some people don't like the flowers after they've faded, but uh, you know, brown is a color too. Hydrangea involucrata. We usually have those at the plant sale. Another thing that we collect here at the Dixon are native azaleas. And I'm not gonna get into details. I could do an entire talk on native azaleas, but we offer a lot of them in our plant sale and they're hard to find. Nurserymen don't wanna grow them. I think they're slow to grow and, you know, they don't present as well in a pot, but they're really, really nice plants. Uh, they're technically, they're uh, botanically, they're rhododendrons, uh, but they're separated, uh, the genus rhododendron, but, uh, the two to grow, that uh, the two most popular ones are canescens and uh, austrinum. Austrinum's yellow and canescens is this, uh, what you're seeing here on the screen. Um, but they're extremely fragrant and just wonderful native uh, plants that uh, are underutilized. I, I, I can't get enough of the native azaleas. This is prunifolia or the plum leaf native azalea. It's the latest to bloom. It blooms like in July. There it is in flower. Late July is flowering. All right, so we've talked about some trees. We've talked about some shrubs that are underutilized. And like I said, a lot of these things are not new to horticulture. They've been around, they just haven't caught on. Um, a plant for dry shade that's really, really fantastic is uh, Epimidium sulfurium. And it's the yellow flowered Epimidium. It's known as Bishop's Hat. Uh, because the leaves look like little uh, uh, hats that bishops wear. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think of the other, there's some other common names. Um, but anyway, we had a lecturer come and, and tell us about Epimedium sulfurium. The nice thing about it, it's an evergreen perennial that will grow in dry shade. Uh, and then it has these wonderful uh, little yellow flowers. And there are groups that collect these that are fanatical about them. There's a whole host of them. This is just one of many, and this is a good performer for the Mid-South, Epimidium sulfurium. Uh, in traditional Chinese medicine, uh, we had a lecturer come and tell us that in traditional Chinese medicine, this was actually, some part of the plant is used as an aphrodisiac. So anyway, kind of an interesting side note. Um, but the fl flowers in a mild winter will persist and just get this real nice, uh, I mean, the, the foliage in a mild winter will persist and get this real nice uh, color on it. Very nice. Another evergreen perennial is a Sarum splendens. And uh, I've been growing this for a number of years and, and I don't know why more people aren't using it as a shady ground cover. It's, uh, it's, it's a good uh, spreader, not too aggressive. It has these wonderful little flowers that uh, are interesting. You're not gonna see the flowers because you have to lift up the leaves to see them. But they're interesting in that a beetle pollinates them. There's a little uh, beetle that's, that, I read a paper once that these plants actually uh, exude a pheromone that attracts these beetles that come in and walk around on the inside and go from flower to flower, pollinating them. So it's kind of a fascinating little aside. But like I said, unless you lift up the uh, foliage on them, you're not going to ever see these, these uh, flowers. Another plant that is uh, a perennial that is... Um, not sold often in the nursery trade because it doesn't present well in a pot. And uh, it's been around for a long time. In fact, uh, in uh, Vicki McDonald's garden here in Memphis, uh, she had a huge uh, uh, spread of Spigelia marylandica. It was on the cover of a book by uh, Sally Wazowski. It was called Gardening with Native Plants of the South, I think is the title. And in Vicki's garden, was on the cover and it had, the cover was featuring uh, a long shot of the garden, but there were massive clumps of this Spigelia. Takes several years to make a big clump, a sizable clump. And I think that's why nurserymen don't want to grow it. So you have to really know this plant to, to understand what it's going to do when you put it in the, in, in the ground. Uh, nice to have a midsummer flower in the woodland garden because most of the flowers are in the, in the early spring. Here's the flower known as Indian pink. Spigelia marylandica or Indian pink. 
talk about some sun perennials. This is one that we planted over in the uh, uh, new gardens in the butterfly garden over uh, uh, by the new building. And I have just been enamored by this plant. It, if you deadhead it, it will bloom from May till frost. It just keeps going and going. This is salvia rocking the blues. It looks like it cut off the blues, but it's rocking the blues. And uh, great sun perennial for the sheet for the for uh, for the perennial border. You could almost use it as an annual color. It just keeps blooming and blooming and blooming. Uh, and it looks like it has some of the mealy cup sage in it, the Paranacea sage. I'm not sure what the parentage is, but this is a it may be a proven winner or something. I, I'm not sure, but it's a great plant nonetheless. Look at those flowers. What a great color. And while we were waiting to start the presentation, someone was asking about dahlias here at the Dixon. I think dahlias are underutilized here in the Mid-South. And uh, uh, Kim Rucker in the gardens has a whole program on dahlias that she does. So I'm not gonna go into great detail, but I do think dahlias are underutilized. Um, the uh, the uh, Karma series, I think is a good one. And then there's a series of artists uh, like Leonardo, Monet, um, their, uh, their name, Picasso, their different art names. I think it's the gallery series, maybe. And, uh, and those tend to perform the best for us. But they're wonderful because they start blooming late summer and they go through till frost. And the more you cut them, the more they bloom. As you can see, you've got buds and open flowers. And uh, you'll have flowers in all stages uh, at any given time in the late summer. Um, so it's one of those things that really cheers you up after you're... Uh, been through a hot summer in, in, in the Mid-South. I, I will say that they need some protection from the um, hot afternoon sun. Uh, and interestingly enough, they're native to Mexico, but I think they grow in a little bit higher elevations in Mexico where they uh, get a little cooler at night. And they tend to start really showing off when the nights get a little cooler here. But this was taken this morning, so you can see how wonderful they look. Great cuts. Another plant that uh, anybody who is watching, that has shade that's watching this presentation should have in their garden is the Dixon strain foam flower. And it's highly variable seed strain uh, of, of uh, Tiarella cordifolia. And uh, this is the Dixon strain. Just a wonderful spring flowering foam flower. And it, if you look at it, it looks like big, uh, uh, this is actually Vicki McDonald's garden here, but uh, it makes like these big, foamy uh, masses when grown together. Um, I'm really not going to talk a whole lot about this plant because most people who have a shade garden have this plant, but it is, it's a real winter for us. Um, but I just want to note the botanical name is polygonatum, and I'm setting you up for this other plant that I'm going to show you. Uh, this is deciduous, so it goes totally dormant in the winter. But it's a real good plant. It's a pass along. It's fairly common in gardens. I, I, I can't get enough of it. I really, really love it. And uh, it spreads, but not too aggressively. And uh, when it does get a little out of bounds, you can share it with your friends. Digs very easily. Very attractive variegated plant. Uh, the variegated Solomon seal. But what I want to show you is a plant that has the same common name as Solomon seal, but this is the evergreen. Solomon seal. And it is truly, truly a spectacular plant. Um, we divide this, divide it for our plant sales and uh, it keeps growing and growing and growing and, uh, but it stays, stays within bounds. It doesn't run, it's, it makes nice clumps. I mean, this thing is, uh, is as tough as monkey grass almost. It's just, uh, uh, if you have shade and you want a good evergreen, low growing plant, uh, I can't say enough good things about Dysphoropsis pernii or Evergreen Solomon seal. Fantastic plant. Here it is uh, in a little mass. Um, you can see it sort of stays put. It uh, grows real thick. And one thing I like about it is it grows so thick it shades out the weeds. We offer it at the plant sale. Uh, it's hard to find. Not too many people are offering this, but they should because it's a great plant for the Mid-South. And then I had to throw this slide in. This is a, uh, the first plant we looked at was the uh, variegated Solomon seal. And this is the dwarf Solomon seal. It's the same genus polygonatum as the variegated one. 
but this is polygonate of humile. And this is a dainty little thing. It's about eight inches high. But I think if you have like a hosta collection or something, this is a good little accent plant to grow with it. It is deciduous, it dies back to the ground, but uh, what a cute little plant. And we have some nice little uh, clumps here at the Dixon and it's, it's a great little plant to share with your friends as well. <clears throat> All right, I have a couple more uh, plants to show you. And this is uh, not a really a grass, this is a juncus, which uh, is, a, uh, is a rush. Anytime you see that name juncus, it's a rush. And sort of whatever you have uh, in, uh, when you have um, uh, classes in agristology that I took at Oregon State that they have this uh, little adage that they say, they say uh, sedges have edges and rushes are round. So these are round combs that go all the way to the ground. Uh, they're round uh, cylinder-like uh, combs. And this is one called Blue Arrow and it's evergreen. And I think it could be used a lot more. It's tough as nails. It'll take our wet soils. If, if you've got a poorly drained conditions, it'll take that and really, really thrive in it. Uh, Juncus Blue Arrow. If you've noticed a lot of the uh, new developments and stuff, they have to put in these little areas that hold storm water back for a period of time before it releases it, They're, which is a great thing. They're trying to clean up some of our waterways. And instead of having uh, turf in those areas, I think you could have masses of this uh, juncus in there, uh, this blue arrow. And uh, it would be very attractive. It would be attractive year round. You may want to cut it back every now and then whenever it, if it starts to look ratty and let it come back out. But, but I think it's a, a great plant that's underutilized and a very useful plant. Juncus blue arrow. Isn't that attractive? And those stems are round, so it's really nice. All right, this is my last slide, and uh, this is the other parking lot island. We talked about the parodia that you see in the background there, no irrigation. This is another, uh, we used to call it the global warming bed because it gets no uh, irrigation whatsoever. So the plants that we plant in here have to be really, really tough. And this is a true cedar. Uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, uh, Cedrus Atlantica, which is the blue atlas cedar. And the Botanic Gardens, they have some 30, 40 foot specimens over there. This is a dwarf form called horseman. And it is a really, really good plant. And I think it combines well with this agave. And you're thinking agaves, those don't grow here. Well, if you have a dry site where it's not getting too much water and you're not irrigating, you can actually grow this. This has been in the ground about eight years here at the Dixon and it's Agave ovatifolium, and it's totally winter hardy. It is the toughest of all the agaves, and it really provides a sense of interest, and uh, uh, people uh, always ask about it, and it's just a great plant to add to, uh, to a dry garden here, um, and it'll get bigger and bigger over time. What a great plant. Agave ovatifolium, and we, had a, we have a bunch of them that we were gonna sell on the plant sale this spring. So we will have some and they'll be bigger and better for next year. So um, anyway, agave ovatifolia, what a wonderful plant. And uh, you know, I was thinking about how long some of these plants have been in and, and sort of the thought of time and, and how plants appreciate over time. This is a, a Yelena witch hazel that I planted. Uh, and my daughter here, she's probably six years old maybe. Here she's smelling the witch hazel in the winter time, and uh, she's now 17 and uh, a senior in high school. So uh, anyway, uh, just enjoy everything while you can because time passes by quickly. That's for sure. So anyway, that's uh, that's my presentation. Uh, thanks for listening, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. And I must say that this format is really odd because I get no audience response. I mean. I don't know how, what, you know, you kind of get feedback when you're, when you're live, but uh, uh, it's, it's been an interesting experience. But uh, anyway, I'm happy to take any questions. Well, that was great, Dale. Thank you. Um, hey. There are lots of questions. And so um, let's see. We will, lots of comments too. So I'm going to skip over some. And also the names are going to, I'm going to need help with them, Dale. 
Um, let's see. Julie, of course, said that the uh, the dove tree, the handkerchief tree, is one of her favorites. And Susan Johnson says it's stunning when it's in bloom. And um, and then Juliet wanted uh, someone to remind her of the name of that. I think it was the handkerchief tree. Um, yes, the handkerchief tree is Davidia involucrata, and. Uh, um, it grows very, very well over in England, but uh, surprisingly, it does well here too. So uh, we have a, an outstanding specimen here at the Dixon, and it's really something that you don't see very often. So um, I had a question, actually. I have a dogwood in my front yard that uh, I think has mildew, and also it gets nothing but harsh afternoon sun. And I think it's just maybe a little too much for the dogwood. So next year, I'm going to have to put another one in. So what's a good medium-sized tree that, had, that, gets, that can handle getting nothing but harsh afternoon sun? Well, harsh afternoon sun is kind of tough, but you might try the, um, um, if you're wanting something that flowers like that, you might try the, the straight Kusa dogwood. It tends to take a little bit more sun, and once it's established, it can do well. You know, and you see old dogwoods uh, that have been, uh, uh, especially like out in rural settings, it's, you see dogwoods that are uh, big mature ones that are in full sun. And uh, so I think once they get established, they can be a little bit more tolerant. But the mildew is, is a serious problem. And, uh, and I would recommend going to the University of Tennessee website or contacting the extension office and finding out which ones are, are the most uh, mildew resistant. I know uh, two things, uh, the dogwood anthracnose and the mildew are two things that they're really, really trying to breed resistance into, uh, and, and they've got really good programs going at, at University of Tennessee here in the state. Okay, thanks. Well, um, Loretha was interested in knowing, uh, once again, the name of that plant that you said was wider than tall, um, the cephalotaxis? Cephalotaxis. Yeah. Cephalotaxis. It's known as the plum yew. It's the Duke Gardens plum yew. And there's a couple other varieties out there. There's one called Utopia, which is supposed to be very similar to the Duke Gardens. Um, we planted Utopia, but uh, we don't have as big a specimens as we do of the uh, Duke Gardens here. But uh, what a great plant. Well, Juliet um, had a comment about the John Baldwin boxwood. Uh, she said that about six years ago, she got one and it's already about six feet tall and she loves it. So she recommends that plant too. And well, um, so I, I guess then, I need to change my slide. Maybe I need to say in five years instead of instead of uh, ten years uh, how big it'll get. Uh, well, Sharon wants to know where you order in the Buxus John Baldwin. Uh, she says I have this Daphne. If you would like uh, for me to give you the cuttings, I've had it for over twenty years. Wow. Yes, I would love to have some cuttings. Uh, yeah, um, e email me or, or, uh, or drop me a note and, and uh, yeah, I'd love to get some cuttings. So where do you order the John Baldwin from? Uh, there's a, a wholesale nursery in Virginia called Saunders Brothers, and that's probably the only nursery that's really growing that plant. And uh, they're a specialty boxwood nursery, and uh, uh, out of Virginia, and it's, it's a real, real nice place. Well, Kelly Grayson wants everyone to know that um, that she tried the Proven Winners Little Redheads by Julia uh, Mary Landica this year, and it did really well compared to others. So uh, another recommendation there. And uh, Mary wants to know how tall the Junkus Blue Arrow grows. About three feet. And there's, uh, there's another one that's even harder, to, it's harder to find though, it's called blue dart. And blue dart is about 18 inches. So it's almost identical, the plant's identical except for the size. So about three foot on the blue arrow and the blue dart is about 18 inches. And uh, Jim and Ann Eoff, they, uh, wanted, they asked, do your dahlias require digging up each year and replanting? We have found that if you have good drainage and you mulch them with pine straw or something, a light mulching, uh, they will make it through the winter and come back as a perennial here for us. Um, 
you know, a lot of people dig them up. Some, some years we've dug them up. A lot of times we'll plant something else in their place, so we have to dig them up. But ones we've left in the ground have been surprisingly perennial. So I got some from the Dixon. That I got some in the, uh, the gallery series that were beautiful and planted them in a really sunny spot and they bloomed and were gorgeous and then died. So what did I do wrong? I don't know, you know, a lot of, one of the things if they bloomed and, and, and we're doing everything right, uh, I think too much water can, can, uh, can, can be a problem. Um, so that's, that's um, that could be it. Um, and, you know, depending on how deep they were, um, uh, there could have been some freezing issues as well. Well, mine, they never lasted through the winter. I just have a, a really brown thumb, Dale, that's all. Um, and then Jill wants to, uh, to know the size of the edge worthia. Um, and also, does it need sun or shade? So how big does edge worthia get? I would say if you can give it a little bit of protection from the hot afternoon sun, it's going to be happiest. Uh, there are two forms of Edgeworthia. There's Edgeworthia papyrifera, which is a bigger plant, and it gets maybe five feet tall. The uh, Edgeworthia chrysantha is a smaller plant. They're both called paper bush, but the, uh, the chrysantha is a little bit smaller. It has the more blue-green foliage, and it's my preferred preferred one and it's probably about three foot tall. Well Dale Engelberg has a question about irrigation. Um, Dale wants to know if it was a drip line that we put into the cutting garden, who installed it, and anything else that Dale needs to know about it. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, cutting garden irrigation is, um, is a um, it's basically pressure compensating drip irrigation, which means that um, every emitter emits the exact amount of water, whether it's the first one closest to the spigot, the first hole closest to the spigot, or the hole furthest away, it's all getting the exact same amount. It's a, it's a company named Netafim, called Netafim. It's, uh, the technology was developed in Israel for agriculture in Israel. And that's what we put in there. Um, and we did that in-house. That was one of my early projects here at the Dixon. We had, uh, you know, we we're talking about mildew on dogwoods. Well, we had, we grew a lot of uh, zinnias and uh, phloxes and stuff in the cutting garden. And the spraying water from the overhead irrigation caused mildew. And so we were having to spray fungicides to control the mildew. And I was like, well, let's just get the environment right by putting the drip irrigation down. So we, we installed that. It's fairly easy to install. If, uh, if you're handy at all, you can, you can, you can do that. They also make uh, little ones that have spaghetti tube that comes off of it, little uh, smaller tubes that come off a main tube and have the little emitters. Um, I like drip irrigation. It's, uh, it puts the water where you want it. It doesn't water the weeds. The only downside to drip irrigation is uh, it sometimes is prone to clog and whenever you find out that you have one clogged or it's not functioning, you can't see it working. So usually a plant is dead by the time you figure out that the irrigation is not working. But to answer your question, it's Netafim. We installed it. Yes, you can install it. And um, it, it's great stuff. Okay, well, that is all the questions. So thank you very much. That was great. Um, I know I learned all kinds of things about the plants that that will work and, and I've gotten some great ideas and, uh, and want to go out and get some. So um, thank you so much. And if you want to, everyone can unmute and give like a last little goodbye to everybody and say thanks to Dale. Thank you, Dale. Bye. Thank you, Dale. <laughs> great. Thank, thank you, Dale. Uh, great program. Thank you. Do we have a date for the Dixon plant sale? I'm sorry. Is there a date for the Dixon plant sale? Uh, there is, but I, I would have to look at my computer to see it. And I, I'm kind of okay. using it now. But yeah, we've, we've got a date set already. I think it's, I want to say it's the, I think it's the April 15th around that weekend. That Thursday's the preview party for members only. And then we have the Friday and Saturday sale. But whatever, the, around April 15th is what it is this year. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks. 
Uh, All right. Bye, everybody. Can't wait to see you in person. Bye. 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 Bye, Dale. Bye. Au revoir. Bye, Dale. Dale, I know it's hard to tell when you can't get feedback from doing Zoom things myself, but you did great. <laughs> Just know. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye, everybody.